Hello students, I hope you are doing great. So today, I'll be discussing with you all about India as a quasi-federal state. Okay, students, this is the continuations of the previous chapter only. Okay, from the forms of government, we have discussed about the unitary state and the federal state. This is the continuations of that chapter only. Okay, so this is the last one. Okay, of that chapter. So India as a quasi-federal state. So let let us start. Okay. So, let me read it out. The Constitution of India describes India neither as a federation nor a unitary state. So, it's Article 1. It simply declares India, that is Bharat, okay, shall be a union of states. Okay. So, it clearly says that students, it is neither a federation nor a unitary state. I have already told you before only when we were discussing about the unitary state and we were, when we were discussing about the federal state, I have told you that India is neither a unitary one, neither it is a federal one. Okay, It is a mixture of both. It doesn't favor a total federa federation, neither it favors the unitary one. Okay, It's a mixture of both. That is why it is called a quasi-federal state. Okay, so it is neither completely a federal one, neither it is a unitary one. Okay, so we can say that it has both the features. That means it has both the federal features as well, as well as the unitary features. Okay, I hope it's clear. Okay, that is why it's called a quasi-federal state. Okay, so now let us discuss the characteristics. Okay, that means a federal characteristics of the Indian states. Okay. Okay. Number one, division of powers between the union and the states. Okay. So let me read it out. Like a federal constitution, the constitution of India divides powers between the union government and the state government. Okay. It means, students, that the constitution has given both the government the powers. Right, the powers to the central government as well as the powers to the state government. Okay, so total students, there are three types of subjects. Okay, that means there are three types of list or the subject where the powers are divided of central government and the state government. Okay, so let me read out uh, the subjects, okay, or the list of the union government and the state governments. So there are three types, okay. Number one is your union subjects, number two is your state subject, and number three is your concurrent subjects, okay. So number one, that is your union subjects, okay. Union subjects, there are 97 union subjects, okay. It means that students, the union subject is the central one, okay. So that means the central government, that means the union government has the power to make uh, laws under that subject, okay. In 97 subjects has been given to the union, okay, and they have the power to make the laws under that union list or the union subjects. I hope I'm very, very clear, right. So, union subjects, that is, they have 97, we have 97, so it contained in the union list, okay, over which the union government, they legislates and they administers them in the whole of India, okay. So, that means they have the power to make the laws under that 97 subjects, the union government students, okay, okay. Now, let us see uh, the subjects okay of the union government okay now let us see number one is the defense armed forces of the union foreign affairs war and peace railways shipping currency banking and many more okay so these are the subjects okay uh, that comes under the union list where the central government can make the laws under this particular subjects i hope i'm very very clear okay so next one is your state subjects now state subjects has 66 okay there are 66 state list or the state subjects where the state government can make the laws under that particular subjects okay so 
66 state subjects contend in the state list over which the um, each state student the government they can legislate and administer them in its own territory okay so now let me read out the state list contents okay of the subjects that is public order police prisons public health forest fisheries agricultures and many more okay so these are the 66 subjects that these are the state subjects where the state can make where the state government can make the laws under that particular subjects okay so next one is your concurrent subjects so there are 47 okay there are 47 concurrent subjects okay so this 47 concurrent subjects is the one over which the union government and as well as the state government both can legislate okay and whatever comes under this concurrent list such as the criminal law okay such as the criminal procedure preventive detention marriage trade unions and some other okay and many other things are there so whatever comes under your concurrent list okay that means the 47 subjects okay and these are the subjects which has been dealed by the central government or as well as the state government okay so in uh, this concurrent list is the one where the central government and as well as the state government can make the laws under this concurrent one okay so union subjects are 97 where they can make the laws under that particular subjects and state list or the state subjects are 66 subjects where they can make the where they can make the laws under that particular subjects or sub particular list right uh, next one is a concurrent one okay where they have 47 where both the central government and as well as the state government both can make the laws which falls under your concurrent list or your concurrent subjects i hope i'm very clear in this one right so this shows there is a division of powers between the union and states okay there is a power the powers has been divided between the union as well as with the states okay now next one is your dual polity now let me read india establishes a dual polity each citizen is subject to two government okay that means it means our con uh, that it means that india okay uh, our uh, india establishes a dual administrations or india establishes a dual polity okay so central government students central government it looks after the administrations of the entire country and state government looks after the administrations of the particular country okay and it is also the duty of the state government to look after the administration after the whole administrations of the state and it is the duty of the central government also to look after the administrations of the entire country okay so this is the dual polity okay this is the next federal characteristics of the indian states now next one is your written constitution okay so next one india has a written constitution which lays down the division of powers between the center and the states okay so it says that our constitution is a written constitution okay so which is one of the most important feature of the federations okay our constitution is a written one students okay so in written constitutions everything has been uh, clearly uh, defined okay the powers such as the legislative one the administrative powers and the financial relationship between them it has been clearly been clearly been defined in our constitutions okay so both the central government and the state government both of them have defined or like both of them have um, derived their powers from the constitutions okay i hope it's clear okay now next one is the rigidity of the constitution in respect of the federal provisions 
So it says that Article 368 of the Constitution, it lays down a special procedure of amendment of the constitutions. It means, students, that in India, okay, our constitution is sometimes rigid and sometimes flexible. Okay, it cannot totally become rigid. It cannot totally become flexible. It has to be a mixture of both. It has to be sometimes rigid. It has to be sometimes flexible. Okay, so in a unitary state, we have already studied in a unitary form of government that the constitution is mostly flexible, right? So and in federal state, that is in USA, we have discussed. So we discussed that the constitution is mostly the constitution is rigid okay so but in our country that is in india we have both rigid as well as flexible okay so, because we have to go to different process okay to bring the changes in the constitutions okay that means that the state government's consent is also very very important and if the state government agrees to make a certain changes to be brought in the constitutions then they can do it but for that there has to be a two-third of the members present and voting has to be there okay they have to pass with the special majority of a vote okay now next one is here constitution is the supreme law of the land so both the union government and the state government derive their powers from the constitutions so it says that both okay both the government okay they exercise their respective powers in accordance with the constitutional provisions okay so that is why the constitution is very very supreme okay and no one can violate it okay so this is number five federal characteristics of the indian state now last one is your number f is your bicameral union parliament let me read it out a bicameral legislature is again considered an essential feature of a federal constitution the indian constitution provides for a bicameral union parliament okay so it means students that in federations okay we have discussed that there are two houses right so i have told you before also by means two union means one okay so uh, in federations there are two houses such as uh, in usa they have two houses such as house of representatives and they have house of senate okay like similar like in same way in our country also we have two house in your pal in our parliament that is we call it as sansad okay so we have two house that is lok sabha and rajya sabha as you also know about it right so lok sabha is your lower house which is also called the house of people okay and rajya sabha is called your upper house okay that is also called your house of council of the states okay so one represents the people of the country lok sabha okay and another one represents the state council okay that is your rajya sabha okay so that is very very similar okay to the house of senate and the house of representatives so house of senate is very very similar uh, uh, to the Rajya Sabha and House of Representatives is very similar to Lok Sabha because House of Representatives is called lower house and House of Senate is called your upper house okay but when we look at the states okay in our 29 states we have we, we have a bicameral legislature okay and some states have a, a, a unicameral legislature and some states have a bicameral legislature in states um, uh, we call it as a Vidhan Parishad and we call it as a it as a Vidhan Sabha okay Vidhan Sabha is known as your state legislative assembly and your um, Vidhan Parishad is known as your state legislative council okay but in our 29 states in our country okay only in seven states we have a bicameral legislature okay in every states we find in, in we find every state there are Vidhan Sabha, that is state legislative assemblies, okay. But there are only seven states of our country where we have the Vidhan Parishads, okay. So, Vidhan Parishad, as we can also call it as a legislative council, okay. So, the states where they, the states where they have both the Vidhan Sabha and Vidhan Parishads are Andhra Pradesh, Maharashtra, Bihar, Uttar Pradesh, Jammu and Kashmir, Telangana and Karnataka.
taka okay and besides of the states or the states they have vidhan sabha okay all the states have a unicameral legislatures okay only this seven states they have the bicameral legislature that means they have both vidhan sabha and they have both vidhan parishad okay i hope it's very very clear right so all these features students it shows the federal character of the indian constitutions i hope it's clear right so these are the federal characteristics of the indian state okay okay now next features next features is a subsidiary unitarian features of the indian union of states okay now number 1 presence of strong central government so let me read it out the unitary character of the indian union is demonstrated fully by its provisions which established a very strong central government Okay, so it ignores the true spirit of division of power, students. Okay, by making the union substantially more powerful than the states. Okay, now let me tell you the following facts or the reasons. Okay, which reflect the unduly strong positions of the union in the Indian constitutional systems. Okay, that means which in which central government becomes very very powerful. Okay, so. number one reason is as most of the important subjects are under the union list okay as i've already told you that there are how many subjects there are 97 subjects okay so in which the union government or the central government can make the laws under that 97 subjects okay they can make the laws over in that subjects and sometimes it also can make the laws on the state subjects okay how many state subjects we have there are 66 state subjects okay and in that also central government or the union government has the power to make the laws on the state subjects as well okay so next reason is all the finances are provided by the center okay so the states are totally dependent upon the centers okay these are also another reasons okay why central is very very powerful and next one is the concurrent list it contains 47 subjects okay in which both the central government and the state government both can make the laws okay there are 47 subjects which comes under the concurrent list in which state government as well as the central government can make the laws that falls under the 47 that falls under the concurrent list okay but what happens is that but there occurs a dispute okay but if there occurs a dispute in the bill that has been passed by the state government okay in the subject mentioned in the concurrent list so at that time the union government can make the laws okay and this also makes the union government very very powerful okay so over here also we can see that though the uh, in concurrent list okay both the state government and central government can make the laws over here okay but if there occurs a dispute in the bill which has been passed by the state government okay that is the subject mentioned in the concurrent list and that time the central government has the power to make the laws okay in this way this becomes more powerful the central government becomes more powerful over here also while making the laws under the concurrent list okay i'm am i i hope i'm clear right so next one is your most of the policies are framed and implemented by the center only so this all makes the central government very very powerful okay so this is the presence of a strong central government so next one is here the center can reorganize the states and can change their boundaries so let me read it under the constitution the union government can change the boundaries of the state so 
what happened in 1956 students like uh, the union parliament okay in 1956 the union parliament had passed the states reorganization act okay and made the wholesale changes in the territories of the states so thereafter this exercise has been continuously in progress okay so we can say that only the union government has been given the power to reorganize the states okay that means the boundaries can be changed only by the union government it cannot be changed by the state government it has the only the central government has the power to change the boundaries or to reorganize the states okay like in the past years we have seen that there has been a change in the boundaries such as in west bengal east pakistan arunachal pradesh nagaland manipur etc okay so goa is now a state students okay and delhi has a near statehood okay so other states like uttarakhand chatisgarh jharkhand and telangana okay all that came into an existence on 1st of june 2014 okay so these are all the examples these are all the recent examples which highlight the power of the union to change the boundaries of the states so all the changes in the boundaries of the federating units Uh, of india have been the result of the central actions taken with or without the consent of the concerned states okay i hope it's very very clear okay that means the union government only has the power to reorganize the states okay only the central government has the power to uh, reorganize the state or they has the power to change the boundaries okay i hope it's very very clear okay so now number 3 is some limitations upon the juris jurisdictions of even in respect of state subjects so let me read it out the constitution vests in each state the power to legislate and administer the subjects contained in the state list okay so it says that students um the state especially okay the states has how many subject it has 66 subjects okay where the state can make the laws under that particular list under whatever comes under that 66 subjects the state has the power to make the laws regarding that okay but there are certain limitations okay there are certain limitations that is been upon the jurisdiction of the states okay so even in respect of the state subjects so let us see what are the limitations okay so number 1 the governor can reserve any bill passed by the state legislature on a subject of a state list for the assent of the president okay that means the governor can withhold the bill okay and the governor can hold the bill okay can reserve the bill that has been passed by the state legislature okay on a subject regarding on a state list okay for the consent of the whom for the consent of the president okay so such a law can be amended only by the union parliament such a law can be amended can be changed only by the union parliament okay so that is number one limitations and number two limitation is students sometimes okay so it means upon a request made by the two or more state legislature the union parliament can make a law on a state subjects so we can also say that sometimes the state government students can request the central government to make a laws mentioned in the state list okay so this can this is the another number two limitations okay and number 3 is so during the period of emergency 
okay so the union parliament in the period of emergency also the union parliament has the power who has the power the union parliament the central government has the power to legislate that means the central government has the power to make a laws okay on the subjects that is contained in the state list okay so emergency in emergency period the union parliament that means the central government becomes very 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 powerful and all the powers like lies are vested in the hands of the central government and they have the power to make laws on the subject that is contained in the state list i hope i'm very very clear okay now next one that is number 4 or d that is the emergency provisions of the constitution so let me read it it also reflect the unitarian spirit of the constitution during an emergency the union government gets the power to make any law okay so it means students that emergency provisions okay of the indian constitution it also reflect the unitarian spirit of the constitution as i have already written it over here right so in the em event of the emergency arising due to due like due to an external aggressions or due to a war okay so india or due to an internal armed rebellion the president okay the president can declare what the president can declare a national emergency in india okay a national emergency comes under article 352 352 okay when such an emergency that means when such a national emergency is occurred okay the union parliament gets the power who gets the power the union parliament the central government gets the power okay to make any law or take any decisions okay the union parliament gets the or the union government gets the power to make any law or take any decisions which it deems fit for meeting the emergencies i hope till here it's very very clear right so so in such an event it becomes the duty of whom it becomes the duty of the states okay to follow the central directives and authority okay so next one the constitutions of india starts working as a unitary constitutions over here okay so under article 356 so this is all about national emergencies under article 352 okay where everything lies in the hands of the union government they when they have the power to make the laws okay and in next and another emergency is your constitutional emergencies which comes under article 300 and 356 okay so <coughs> sometimes what happen is that in a states okay if any of the state government okay fails <coughs> excuse me to run according to the constitutions or the majority is not there or they have uh, not conducted uh, a session okay as per the constitutions okay in that case the government becomes unconstitutional okay and gets dissolved okay and from that time the president will imposed and the administrations of that particular state will go in the hands of the president okay and president will look after the administrations of that state okay and president with the help of the governor okay of that particular state will look after the administrations of that state okay so this is the emergency provisions of the constitutions over here also we can clearly see that the union government is very very powerful during the time of emergency also okay so this is number 4 emergency provisions of the constitution now next one is your number e that is number 5 some control of the union over states in certain issues okay so let me read it out each state of the indian union 
has been assigned the duty to exercise its executive authority in such a manner as can ensure compliance of union laws okay it means students that the union government okay the union government uh, they can give and dire give a dir directions to the states okay it means that constitution also empowers the union government to give a directions to any state government regarding the constructions okay regarding the matters of the constructions and the maintenance of the means of communications okay so we can also say that the union parliament it has the power to declare any highway any highway or waterway as a national highway or national waterway okay so this has some control of the union over states in certain issues okay now next feature is here union government that is number f union government alone can amend the laws the union government alone can initiate the process of amending the constitutions okay it means that like um, union government alone they have the uh, power to initiate okay a process of amending the constitutions and for this what do they need is that the two houses of the union parliament that is the lok sabha and rajya sabha they have to pass the resolutions okay in identical terms with how many majorities with the special majorities what is the special majorities two third is a special majorities okay of their membership okay and both the houses they have to pass the resolutions okay both the houses passes the resolution in order to bring the what amendments okay in the constitutions only some amendment proposals which over the subjects specified in article 368 368 clause 2 okay are required to be sent to the state legislature for ratifications okay so this has been sent to the state legislature for what for ratification okay and it becomes valid if it is approved by one half of the several state legis lectures okay or else the union government alone can carry on the amendment process so we can say that the role of the states in amending the constitution has been kept very minimum now next feature is number g that is a single uniform citizenship so unlike a truly federal constitution the constitution of india provides for a single uniform citizenship to all the citizens irrespective of the domiciles okay so uh, in federations okay like that of the usa the people they enjoy a dual citizenships okay they have a double citizenships so one common citizenship of the whole state and second of the province or of the state of which he is a native okay so but in india we have a single citizenship though you live in a different state but we have a single citizenship okay we don't have a dual citizenship like united states of america okay i hope it's clear now next one is number h that is your single integrated judiciary the constitutions of india provides for a single integrated judiciary common for the union and common for the states okay so it means that the indian judicial system okay so the entire constitution the indian judicial system is a single integrated system okay with the supreme court at the top level okay and it's also known as an apex level now next one will is your high court which comes in the middle okay which comes under your state level as well and next one is your subordinate court at the lower district level okay supreme court at the top level high court in the middle level okay that is in the state level it works under the state level and the subordinate courts it works at the district level is lower level okay and the states in india unlike the counterparts in other federations like the usa and the switzerland they do not enjoy the right to have their own judicial systems okay that means our constitutions of india 
it provides what kind of judiciary it provides a single integrated judiciaries and that is common for both the union as well as for the states okay so i hope it's very very clear okay so this is the last feature uh, of the this is the last um, uh, subsidiary features we can say subsidiary unitarian features of the indian union of the state okay i hope this is very very clear okay if you have any doubts when we do the online classes please let me know okay so please tell me at that time okay so i will clear the doubts so thank you students take care